I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to elders, past, present and future, and to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, if everybody could please make sure their mobiles are switched to silent. Um, you're certainly welcome to take photos uh, during the event, but if I could just ask you to please turn your flash off. And by all means, please share your thoughts and pictures on social media, uh, Insta at Roaring Stories, uh, Twitter at Roaring Stories, and on Facebook at Roaring Stories 268. Hashtag Roaring Stories. In reset, renowned economist Ross Garno shows how the COVID crisis offers Australia the opportunity to reset the economy and build a successful future. And while the old approaches will not work, Ross develops the idea of a renewable superpower. He calls for a basic income, and he explores what the decoupling of China and America will mean for Australia. In the wake of COVID-19, the world has entered its deepest recession since the 1930s. Shocks of this magnitude throw history from its established course, either for good or evil. In 1942, in the depths of war, the Australian government established the Department of Post-War Reconstruction to plan a future that not only restored existing strengths, but also rebuilt the country for a new and better future. As we strive to overcome the coronavirus challenge, we need new practical ideas to restore Australia. Ross Garno is the Professorial Research Fellow in Economics at the University of Melbourne. In 2008, he produced the Garno Climate Change Review for the Australian Government, and he's the author of many books, including the best-selling Dog Days and Superpower. Ross has been consulted on trade policy and relations with Asia and the Pacific from time to time by Prime Minister and Senior Ministers. Of successive Australian governments since the Fraser Government, he's held the positions as chairman of the boards of large Australian and internationally public companies uh, continuously since 1988. Ross Gittins refers to Ross Garner as the nation's most prophetic economist. We're also absolutely thrilled to welcome Richard Aidey this evening as well. Richard has been a journalist for more than 30 years. He has hosted a range of programs at Radio National, including Life Matters, The Media Report and The Sunday Profile. Over the last few years, he has also presented shows on Class, Class Act, Power, Who Runs This Race, Who Runs This Place, and Climate Change Hot Mess. Richard has made award-winning documentaries in Colombia, East Timor, the United States, and the UK. He is former Reuters Foundation Fellow at Oxford. Richard is also the presenter of The Money on Radio National, broadcast on Thursday evenings and repeated on Wednesdays and Fridays, and also is accessible as a podcast uh, via the ABC Listen app. Please give a very warm welcome to Ross Garner and Richard Hay. Thank you very much. So I, I want to start with what, where this came from, Ross. What prompted it? It's the sort of thing I do. Uh, <laughs> I wrote the definitive book about the East Asian financial crisis and the great crash of 2008, in dog days anticipating the uh, difficulties that we were going to face 2013 to 2019 unless we did something about it and regrettably we didn't do anything about it so we had those dog days. Uh, and uh, dur during COVID, Jane uh, up the back in the mask and, uh, and, and I uh, sought to avoid a, a long lockdown in Melbourne by before the gates shut in March, uh, heading to the far west of Queensland, thinking that would be a nice place for warmth and natural social distancing. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we had we uh, set ourselves up in the t with friends in the town of Park Alden, uh, which is the home of the Tree of Knowledge. And uh, uh, Melbourne University was trying to keep uh, students and alumni uh, uh, active in the mind and, uh, and got me to give a series of public lectures 
through the University of Melbourne from under the tree of knowledge in Barcalder. And those, that, those public lectures were uh, uh, what, what the book is based on. So that's one, uh, one uh, story, origin story. But uh, uh, th this uh, uh, has been uh, a, an historic time for an economist interested in the sorts of things that um, I'm interested in. and. Uh, uh, the, the first half of uh, last year, the Australian economy and the world economy had the sharpest downturn ever since modern economic development began. And uh, one's mind naturally uh, turns to uh, working out the, what are the consequences of that going to be. So that's probably the bigger origin. I'll, 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 I'm going to work my way through the book as much as I can in the time we've got. But um, I'm, I'm put in mind, I'm not going to compare it in magnitude. But it, it's a tradition. So Newton heads off home to Woolsthorpe to get away from the plague, uh, and, and he comes up with calculus and works out gravity and optics. And, and you did this, so that. <laughs> well, uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, who, who was a Cambridge uh, uh, man through and through, uh, and Newton, of course, went back to Cambridge uh, in the plague, uh, wrote Principia Mathematica. <laughs> So I did feel a bit of peer pressure, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but actually uh, I felt even more pressure from the bard. Uh, Shakespeare, the only time he ever left London until uh, till he went back to uh, in retirement was during the plague of 1605 and came up with Antony and Cleopatra, Macbeth and Twelve of the Sonnets. So, uh, so that, that doubled, at least doubled the pressure. <laughs> you start in the book by the first chapter is all about knowledge, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering why you decided to begin with that. Well, I, I think we've got a problem in, in our democracies, uh, in the Western democracies, uh, the capitalist democracies in the 21st century of a downgrading of the role of knowledge. And I think it's giving us very poor policy, uh, very poor economic policy, uh, a very poor climate policy, uh, especially in the countries where the downgrading of knowledge has gone furthest, Australia and the US. Uh, uh, and the well, UK, probably, as well. Well, UK, actually, on, uh, it, it's more mixed because uh, they're, they're open to the uh, greater respect for knowledge in continental Europe, as well as being open to Rupert Murdoch and the influences across the Atlantic. Uh, so the UK is always a mixed picture in all of these things. and. Uh, the, the denial of knowledge, of medical knowledge, was really important to how countries, especially developed countries, uh, uh, faced up to the pandemic. And uh, the, the denial was uh, strongest in the US and UK. But, but after uh, Boris Johnson got COVID himself, uh, he was close enough to rationality to turn around and take it seriously after that. Uh, Trump got, got, uh, uh, um, got COVID. Uh, got the best medical treatment in the world, uh, got over it, and said, see, it was nothing. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> you, um, so you mentioned that decline in respect for knowledge present in many democracies. Do you see the pandemic as kind of redressing that, as acting as a kind of correction? Well, uh, I, th I think it's not only wishful thinking, because uh, I think there are some real strands there. Um, uh, I, I mention in that chapter on knowledge the problem of uh, denial of knowledge, obviously for dealing with climate, but also for economic policy, uh, moving away from uh, real analysis, uh, vested interest dominating economic policy discussion. And in the pandemic, uh, uh, where, how many people in the, in the developed countries, developing countries different, even when leaders knew what to do, if they lack a public health system, you can still have a catastrophe. Uh, mm. Uh, and, and most developing countries ha are still having a catastrophe. But uh, for the developed countries, uh, whether how many people died, how many people got badly ill, depended a lot on uh, uh, the attitude to knowledge of leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, that became obvious to democratic politics, to communities, as the year went on. Uh, the most important, the most consequential uh, outcome of that was the destruction of the Trump presidency. Uh, an awful thought, but without uh, the evidence of uh, mismanagement of COVID, uh, Trump may very well be president of the United States today and the world will be in a very different position. So uh, for, for that alone, one has to say... Uh, uh, 
Hey, you're all la you're all laughing. This, this is a dead this is a deadly serious point. <laughs> deadly serious. Uh, um, uh, it, it was the widespread recognition uh, that his d failing to face up to the issue and, mm -hmm. and use knowledge and then the daily uh, uh, contrast on, on the television when he was giving these daily uh, um, uh, broadcasts with uh, Dr. Fauci alongside him, the contrast between ignorance and knowledge uh, uh, influenced enough people to make the difference and uh, that, that brought his presidency uh, to an end. And I, I think that, uh, that obviously it didn't persuade everyone in the United States. Uh, Trump still got um, over 70, over, what was it, over 70 million votes. But uh, uh, it, it persuaded enough people to make a difference. And I think it, it has helped everywhere to some extent to elevate respect for knowledge. And democracy is a product of the Enlightenment. Uh, it, it only works. Not only if uh, there's uh, a respect for knowledge amongst leaders, but where, there's, where there is broadly shared uh, uh, knowledge uh, of important policy things through the community, where you can have a discussion uh, based on common facts. I quote in the book Malcolm Turnbull, uh, uh, some important things he said in, in December, if you, if you don't respect facts, if you don't share across the community uh, 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 respect for facts, then, then democracy uh, is in a terrible place. And I think we, the, the, the democratic capitalist countries, some worse than others, got themselves into that place. I think that uh, the pandemic and the fact that countries that took knowledge seriously did better uh, helps us uh, in, in the way out of that. We need much more, of course, uh, but uh, uh, we see it in uh, uh, a greater respect for knowledge in the world as a whole uh, on the climate issue. Uh, that's something I would, didn't anticipate early in the pandemic, but uh, uh, we've come out of the pandemic with uh, much uh, greater weight being given to uh, uh, knowledge of of climate science than was there a year ago. Come back to that. I want to ask you about where we were before the pandemic, because what the book does is sort of go through that, explain it, and then talk about what has to happen now. We are used to feeling good about ourselves with our 28 years of economic growth, the envy of the world, and, and of course our politicians, our political leaders have, have trumpeted this. But you point out that there's three parts to it. So briefly, just break them down for us. Yes, yeah, so it, it was a great achievement to have 28 years of economic growth unbroken by recession. Recession is terrible things uh, for, for everything, including for equity. So uh, uh, we uh, should be pleased that uh, we had a longer period unbroken by recession than any developed country has ever had. Um, uh, uh, un unambiguously good thing. Uh, uh, I, in, in the book Dog Days, um, uh, published in 2013, I pointed out that the, the growth up till then, uh, uh, we'd had c uh, continuous growth then for uh, over 20 years, um, broke into two periods, the productivity boom, uh, roughly fr from uh, the recession of 91 until about 2002, where Aust Australia led the world in productivity growth. That's very unusual for us. We were bottom of all the countries that are now developed. We had the worst productivity growth through the 20th century uh, as a whole, and certainly in the years up to uh, uh, 1980. But then we, we were the top of the pack in uh, the, the, the 1990s, and that lifted Australian living standards broadly uh, um, across the, the community, uh, gave us a base for uh, uh, and, and, uh, um, some transformational changes. Then incomes kept growing for another decade, from about 2002 and, and to 2012, but from, but from an entirely different source. Productivity growth was low, where there were reforms that had driven the, uh, um, the, the growth of the, uh, uh, the productivity growth of the 90s had, had run out of steam. And, but our incomes kept growing because, uh, because of economic reform and economic growth in, in the world's most populous country. And uh, we had the China resources boom, which lifted average Australian incomes, uh, lifted government revenue, 
uh, lift in investment levels. And so we had the second decade of growth uh, on the back of uh, uh, the world's most populous country uh, experiencing the strongest economic growth any developed country had ever had, any country had ever had on a sustained basis, and being more resource intensive in that growth than any country had ever had. So that's the, the China resources boom. Well, the book um, Dog Days in 2013 said this is not going to stay with us as a source of growth unless we change some things. The next, we're going to go into the dog days. Uh, and and, and uh, looking back, uh, writing now, well, that's what we did do. Uh, in the period 2013 to 19, we still had economic growth, but economic growth is an aggregate. Uh, there was no, virtually no productivity growth. Growth in output per person was lower in Australia than in developed countries as a whole, even than Japan, which we're used to thinking of as a, as a very poor performer uh, economically. We, we were right at the bottom of the pack in out, growth in output per person. Uh, we had stagnant uh, um, uh, real household income per person uh, for those seven years. That's very unusual in history. You can't find seven years in the Great Depression where you had stagnant uh, real income per person for, for, for seven years. So uh, the, the, these were pretty bad times, and unemployment was high at the beginning, uh, over five and a half percent, over five, and it stayed there. Uh, it was that high at the end when, during this same period in the United States, which which was dissatisfied with with how it was going, uh, a lot of uh, criticism of uh, U U U.S. underperformance on unemployment, but they took unemployment from few percent above Australia at the beginning of the dog days, down to 3.5% in, uh, in uh, 2019. And worse than that, um, you're, you're employed for good reasons, uh, according to the statistician, if you worked a week, uh, worked an hour in the week before the survey. Uh, but the, but uh, the, the pr proportion of people who were not working as many hours as they wanted to uh, counted as as employed because they worked a week, but they weren't working as many hours as they wanted to. That proportion rose uh, dramatically through the dog days. So yeah. from every important comparison point uh, with other developed countries and, and in terms of what was happening to Australian living standards, it was a really bad period. And so when uh, early in the uh, pandemic recession, we started to hear Australian leaders say uh, our objective is to snap back to how things were like before the pandemic. Uh, I said, well, let's, uh, let's be a bit careful about that. Let's actually have a look at, uh, at how we were doing in the dog days and uh, see if that's really what we want. And I, I've got a chapter, uh, Wrong Way, Don't Go Back, in which, uh, uh, in, in which I say, first, we wouldn't, shouldn't want to go back, but secondly, for a whole range of reasons, we couldn't do that well if we had the same policies, uh, even if we wanted to go back. You've, you've mentioned uh, employment, and um, I'm struck by the fact that a lot of what you engage with and write about is full employment. These days, it's unusual to hear full employment talked about uh, or written about, but I, I think we need to start with a definition, because there's what people like me think full employment is, and there's what economists think full employment is. So can we just sort that out? Uh, what do you think full employment is? <laughs> I think full employment would be if everybody who wants to have a job and as much work as they think they can do could have a job and as much work as they think they can do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's full employment. Uh, but uh, uh, not everyone can have a... It's simply not possible for everyone to ha have a, as much work as they want exactly when they want it, where they want it. Uh, uh, we did have full employment through the 50s and 60s and early 70s. Uh, that's, that's when I was... Uh, uh, In those days, the Minister for Employment knew all the unemployed by name. <laughs> yes, it was usually... It was 1.5% to 2% uh, in, in Australia. And... Uh, uh, and and that's the point I make about how uh, full employment doesn't mean everyone having a job exactly when they want it, where they want it. That one and a half to two percent was people taking a bit of time uh, when they first enter the labour force or uh, when, when they lose one job and looking for another one. You, you take a bit of time and you might have to uh, search for a while. Well, 
uh, uh, full employment is everyone getting the job they want and the number of hours they want with a reasonable amount of search. And that's what we had through, uh, through, through that period. Uh, now, uh, now uh, economists have come to defi define unemployment, and I'm quite comfortable with the definition, as uh, the, the lowest rate of unemployment that you can have without uh, sending uh, 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 growth in wages to uh, uns to dangerously high levels and accelerating levels. Uh, so in practice, that would be, in those days, that would have been the one and a half or two percent. Uh, and, and so if you're, if you're asked for a number, uh, uh, we came to accept something above five percent is as good as we could get. Well, uh, the Americans didn't. They got down to three and a half percent. We, um, uh, um, but, but we somehow uh, came to accept uh, uh, five percent plus as uh, a, 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 as full employment. Well, it's not. And one of the things I want to do in the book, and I, I think I, I, I think this has been successful, is shape people's view of what's a satisfactory rate of unemployment. Uh, I, I, I think the discussion in the last uh, couple of months has been a different discussion. Well. I, I want to get to what, what a satisfactory rate of unemployment is, but I think we do have to talk what's happened in the last month or so, because we have kind of jumped back you know, like a steep V in terms of um, the, the rebound in employment. So this time last year, we're kind of back to where we were, and the government is very chuffed about this. The Treasurer looks like a Cheshire cat when he's asked about it. Um, what is wrong with what has been achieved? Uh, I commend the, uh, uh, what was done to budget policy back in March and April last year. Uh, I, last year, even though there was only three months of the year left after they started to do something about it, we still, with, the, with JobKeeper, JobSeeker, increased expenditure, we still ran the biggest budget deficit as a share of the economy we ever had last financial year. This year's, even with the big improvements lately, is almost twice as big. I say in the book, this is a champion deficit. Don, Don Bradman never stood so far above his peers. Uh, 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 and um, it, it is not the only cricketing metaphor I can tell you now. <laughs> uh, uh, now, if you spend 15% of GDP in increased government expenditure, it's very good for employment. Uh, it's great, and, and that's what we're living through. And I don't, I, I, I'm not a critic of that. Sure, that maybe. 30 or 40 or 50 billion of people of it might have been wasted, but uh, uh, a lot of it wasn't wasted and did generate uh, I employment. That's what we're seeing now. Uh, uh, but if you uh, achieve a big lift in employment, we, we could get to full employment. If we spent another 15 trillion uh, in, in the next five years, we'd, st we'd have full employment. But uh, you, you, to, to be sustainable, you've got to get a balance between uh, 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 the right amount of debt and full employment. So I've got a chapter of full employment with the right amount of debt. And to keep, for the economy as a whole, to keep that debt management is manageable, a substantial part of the employment growth has to come from export industries. Uh, otherwise, you, you run into big problems uh, down the track. And, uh, uh, and so on. So, so full marks to, to the government. Well, it would have been better if the 30 or 40 50 million that was wasted had been spent on something good, like uh, like transforming our uh, electricity system. Uh, you get, you, you'd have a lot of change out of that. Uh, but but uh, the basic macroeconomic stance was the right one, uh, and and that will keep uh, that's that's reduced unemployment from what would have been a very high level. Could have could have easily Treasury at the time was saying it w could be, could have gone to 15 percent or more. Mm. Well, that's quite right. Uh, down to uh, 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 a much more um, moderate level, but still quite a high rate of unemployment. We now are coming off some of those special programs, and so the, the, uh, we will have a bit of a uh, shudder uh, in the labour market over the next couple of months. But the critical thing is that we maintain the stimulus to the economy, uh, but have a better balance between uh, uh, growth in government expenditure direct creation of employment through those mechanisms we've used so far and development of the export industries. I want, I want to get to, I want to, I've, we've got a lot to get through and I'm conscious of time, but what is 
our level of full employment? Or do we not know? We, well, so long since we've had it, we don't know. Uh, and uh, I say it's, we know it's, we know it's not above four, because we had unemployment above mm. four in 2008, before the GFC, and, and we didn't have inflation. Uh, we, we know the US had 3.5 on the eve of the pandemic and didn't have in, inflation. And I'm saying that we, uh, we, uh, our first, the Reserve Bank has the right objectives. It's, it's, it's by law, it's required to maintain full employment. The word's still there from when Nugget Coombs drafted it for, for Menzies uh, back in the 50s. Uh, um, uh, full employment with uh, uh, inflation and by, by an exchange of letters, by a contractual arrangement, the governor enters a contract with the, with the treasurer on uh, keeping inflation 2 to 3 per cent. Well, uh, uh, I'm saying that the, to honour uh, uh, th those legal, those statutory obligations, mm -hmm. responsibilities, uh, we should, the, the Reserve Bank and the other arms of government should be uh, continuing to exp to run policies that keep expanding unemployment until unemployment is so low that real wages are rising strongly and at an accelerating rate in the marketplace. I would be surprised if that's l l not at least as low as America got before the before the. Uh, so three and a half percent. I'd be surprised. Now I do say we we won't know till we get there. Right. Uh, um, uh, but but you don't anticipate that it might be five and a half or five and, and run economic policies to keep unemployment above that. And that's what we were doing right through the dog days. Um, uh, you keep uh, expanding employment until real wages start rising, rising so much that uh, inflation goes above the targeted band uh, and threatens to keep accelerating from there. Then you know you've got full employment. You've got to hear it squeak, really. Um, we're going to talk more about some of the changes you propose. Um, what you call, cricketing metaphor, big sixes of structural reform. Um, the first is replacing corporate tax with something different. Um, and what you, what you propose is taxing economic rent. So, so very briefly. <laughs> what is economic rent? Economic rent is uh, uh, income that 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 no that people don't have to earn uh, that, that uh, income in excess of the return that's necessary to attract investment into an activity, uh, and uh, it's a big part of our economy, a bigger part of our economy than of other economies, mm -hmm. but it's a growing part of world economies. And, and in in its nature, you if it if you've got the right taxes, you can tax that without diminishing investment. Classic one is resource rents. Mm. Uh, I know this morning's paper, or the last couple of days' papers, have been talking about how the billionaires of Australia have, have uh, increased, d roughly doubled their wealth. Uh, They've uh, had a good uh, pandemic, uh, yes. through the pandemic. Uh, well, well, that's an increase in economic rents. Uh, if if they'd been paying a, uh, a tax on cash flow, that took uh, thirty percent of the. Uh, of all of that to the public revenue, it would not have reduced incentives for investment in iron ore mining. So it's it is it's resources, um, minerals, monopoly, um, monopolies, regulation, uh, blocking entrance in things like banking and uh, patents and, and, and where and pharmacies are, which has always been insane. Yeah, um, and network grants, uh, uh, right. where, where if you own a network, others can't come and duplicate that. Uh, natural rents, where na na uh, uh, natural monopolies, where. First person in to establish a uh, electricity line down. Yep. No, no one else is going to. You can't have competition. You won't have three or four other people putting in electricity lines down the street. And, and some so, kinds so, of retail that are that are very dominant. Yeah, uh, and they're they're a standard monopoly uh, mm. in retailing in Australia. It's. Uh, uh, um, All right. Eight. So you propose to to tax cash flow. So in in simple terms, understandable to an ABC journalist. What is the advantage of doing that? Uh, it, it, it will systematically, uh, it will remove taxation, corporate taxation on genuinely competitive businesses. Uh, and, but will 
tax those who are earning their income through economic rent. It will systematically favour companies that are investing heavily and put more of the tax burden on those who are not investing because you can immediately write off the capital expenditure of, uh, 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 as you incur it. Uh, I'm proposing that, uh, uh, that, that there should be a, 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 a paying back, a, tax to, a, a cashing out of a tax rebate at, uh, for those who, are, who earn negative uh, cash flows so that if someone invests uh, in, in, a, in a new restaurant or, or, or a new guitar for a band, uh, they can immediately write that off, and if the exp capital expenditure is so big that uh, it exceeds their revenue, then you, and the tax rate is 30%, you get 30% cash. So you systematically favour those who take, t uh, take risks, including those involved in research and development, uh, um, be because you get uh, a, a rebate if you make a loss, whereas in the established tax system, it's only if you've got established profits from old businesses that you get a tax deduction if you take a risk and make a loss. Ross, you must be aware that this idea would be resisted by the mining and energy companies, banks, property companies, gas, electricity, telecoms, tollways, even big... It, this is what Sir Humphrey would describe as a courageous policy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it would be, but it would, but it would be supported by... Uh, uh, Everyone in the general community understood it, and uh, uh, a, a ver a, a ver But we don't. We don't have their lobbyists. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, I, I think that we we almost got there with uh, a, a mineral tax. Now, Ken Henry, in his review, uh, um, he made a bit of a muck of it. He came up with a boffinish minerals tax that no one had ever heard of before. Uh, and, and so it was easily shot down. And so when uh, uh, Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan announced it, uh, uh, it, w it was an easy target because uh, there'd been no public discussion of what, what Ken was uh, recommending. It, uh, it, it was easily misrepresented and shot down. But despite that, Kevin Rudd won the political debate uh, and, uh, and he would have won an election on it. Uh, uh, if you look at the polling, fortnight by fortnight after uh, he made that announcement, he, he'd had the, the poll that came out immediately after the announcement had been the result of a survey before the announcement. He, his numbers were down for the only time he dropped below 50% uh, of the two party preferred was after he backed away on climate change, on action mm -hmm. on climate change. But, uh, but once the, the debate on the uh, tax uh, uh, got underway, uh, the the uh, two party preferred for the government went up above 50%, then higher and higher in every successive poll until he was kicked out by the Labor Party. Let's talk about the universal basic income, because that uh, has already been mentioned. You call it the Australian income security. How would you see it working? It's uh, an integration of the tax and social security systems, a set of People, these being completely separate systems, I'd, I'd have so, something equal to the unemployment benefit paid into, directly into the accounts every fortnight of all Australian citizens. Everyone would uh, get it? Except those on high incomes and... About 250. Uh, that's what I suggest, and, and considerable wealth, like two and a half million. Uh, house in uh, Belmain. Yeah, that, that's right. And if you've got a house in Belmain you, and you've got no debt, then... Uh, you're, then you're, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. <laughs> well, you can share it with you can share the two and a half. You, 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 you and your your partner can each have uh, right. two and a half. Okay. But uh, uh, you get the payment in, into your uh, bank account. Then you're taxed at a moderate rate, and I, I talk about thirty-seven percent from the very first dollar of income, uh, and uh, and so uh, you start clawing it back from the first dollar of income. But you've got a steady uh, rate of. Uh, uh, of, with, of, of loss of income as you work more, uh, up to quite a high income. Uh, at the moment, um, you, uh, if, if someone uh, who's, uh, one, who's unemployed uh, or only working a few hours, uh, they lose a lot of their uh, social security payments as income rises. And a combination of that and taxation, once they get above the, the tax threshold, uh, 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 is a powerful disincentive for working more than a limited number of hours of work. 
Uh, and uh, I think this is a very serious deterrent for labor force participation, especially by second earners, especially by younger people, especially by women, because they, most of this, the, the uh, sec secondary earners in households are women. And, uh, and so for all of these reasons, I think we'd have a more efficient economy, uh, but we'd also have a more equitable economy. Uh, the, the job of, uh, 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 of um, Centrelink wouldn't be to make sure that everyone was uh, uh, spending their, their whole life looking for jobs that don't exist. Their job would be to help them find a job, and uh, 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 you, you, and also uh, um, you, I think you get several percentage po uh, points uh, additional labour force uh, participation, and and that would go quite a long way for paying for the system. Let me just. <coughs> you'll be aware that um, Finland has tried something similar for two years. They paid. Uh, 2,000 people, unemployed people, 560 euros a month. Not a lot of money, but still no strings attached. And what they didn't see was an increase in employment prospects for those people. Yeah, well, they didn't uh, change the rest of their social security system in the same way. Didn't and go hard enough. I, yeah, I don't right. think, yeah, it was, a, it was a, 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 an incomplete test. Uh, now, this is a really serious issue, uh, Mike, how much labour force participation you would get out of it. Uh, my assessment is you'd get quite a lot if you remove the poverty traps. If you, at the moment, uh, once someone moves from, say, half hours to full hours, they, they could lose all of their extra income. Uh, uh, from losing social security, uh, family payments, um, other social security, and, and plus the tax they paid, and uh, that, and that's before you take into account that someone in work's got a lot of extra costs, uh, uh, transport, travel, and um, uh, and work clothes, and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, I my own assessment is we get quite a large response. But this this has to be studied seriously. I noticed Mike Keating did a serious review of. Uh, uh, of the book in um, in pearls and irritations, and uh, he he agrees with it all. Excellent review, except for this one. And he says that he doesn't think you would get right. a, 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 a participatory response. But I, but but I, I, just just one other uh, important um, uh, uh, benefit is that it becomes a top up of incomes for those on very low incomes. Mm. Uh, without deterring participation in employment. Uh, and that's tremendously important for social cohesion and for implementation of a reform program now in Australia uh, when uh, growing inequality is the source of uh, division in society and, uh, uh, and um, uh, incoherence in, in public discussion. We haven't gone as far as the US went but the U.S. had uh, growing inequality and stagnant uh, incomes of ordinary people for 40 years, uh, and that created the conditions that made Trump possible. We've only had it in the dog days. We've only had it in seven years. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we think uh, we could have it for multiple decades without getting Trump-like results. Um, I want to ask you about the superpower opportunity, and of course you wrote an entire book about this. It was the last book. Um, and I want to get you to talk uh, again briefly about what could be done. But I have to say, this time last year, I was in the middle of making a series for Radio National called Hot Mess, which really looked at why we've done so little about climate change. And most of it comes down to the fossil fuels industry's capture of different levels of government and, and also the weaponization of climate change as a kind of political idea in political terms. I did finish more positively than I started, but do you think that those things are changing? Uh, I think the global situation has changed enormously. Uh, the Europe and the UK have been in a good space on climate change for a long time. Uh, Japan and Korea, the developed countries of the Western Pacific, and New Zealand and Canada have been in a reasonably good place for, for a long time. Uh, Canada had had an aberration and came back, but uh, 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 but uh, what has changed dramatically is what's happened in the U.S. To going from a president and a ruling party uh, that denies the science mm -hmm. to 
to one that not only accepts the science but, but puts achievement of zero emissions in electricity by 2035, uh, zero emissions in everything by 2050, and uh, putting those two things in the centre of his domestic policy and saying that, um, uh, that, that the, the US is going to make uh, the world getting to zero emissions by 2050 the centre of uh, international policy. So uh, uh, that, that is a very big change. And partly in anticipation of that, uh, Korea and uh, Japan, who were in a reasonably good space, made their commitments much more precise in the second half of last year, mm -hmm. uh, zero emissions by 2050. China in September adopted a... Uh, uh, a goal of zero emissions by 2060. Australia is the only developed country that now doesn't have a zero emissions firm commitment and uh, that, that, that even in Australia creates a very different political situation and uh, 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 so, so, so that at least has changed and, and, uh, 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 and that is not what I would have expected uh, as we drifted into the pandemic recession. Uh, I thought it likely that uh, the preoccupation first with the health issue and then with the economic recession would take people's minds off uh, the, the mm. climate issue. Uh, that, that, that it was quite likely it would become more difficult, but the, also uh, fossil fuels became very cheap uh, as a result of the recession. Uh, for a while, amazingly, in May and June, uh, uh, you had uh, the oil companies had to pay people to carry away yeah, crude oil, uh, uh, and cheap fossil energy is not good for uh, reducing demand for it's fossil not. energy. But uh, 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 but despite all of these developments, uh, the the international community moved very strongly in the direction of stronger action, especially because of what happened in the U.S. But but it's it's a global phenomenon. Um, Australia will, will respond to that. Uh, 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 whether we we emb whether we embrace the uh, the change and uh, embrace the opportunity associated with that, and that's the super power book. We'd be a richer country if we went further faster, uh, because we are the place in the world to make zero emissions products uh, because of our renewable resources and our. Uh, uh, opportunities for carbon in the landscape. Uh, whether we embrace the opportunity and, and, and uh, this becomes a very important part of our path to full employment with rising incomes, or as I say in the book, uh, shuffle uh, uh, sideways uh, like a crab under the ocean towards, uh, to, towards getting with the American strength. Uh, the, the one way or another we'll end up in that position. The main difference is we'll, we'll be much richer and we'll have uh, full employment if we embrace it. You also talk about how we could kind of tack there in a diagonal way because the states are in a different place. I mean, they're obviously, all, not all states are the same, but the states have a different approach to the feds. Now, this is a really important point and it says something big about our politics and, uh, and we, uh, it's, a, it's a point I should have made when you were asking me about uh, whether our politics can support strong action on climate. Yes, it can. We know that because Is it the six, states? six yes, states yes. and two territories have, well, first they're committed to zero emissions by 2050, but they've got very strong policies in place mm. to do that. And the three liberal states, on average, are at least as strong as the uh, Labor states. In New South Wales in November, Matt Keane's uh, uh, legislation, it's, it's not nationally important uh, and it, it, it will take New South Wales a long way. Uh, the, the, the Liberal government in, uh, uh, in South Australia, uh, it built on uh, what the Labor government of Jay Weatherill had done, but Stephen Marshall has taken that further uh, and, uh, and made, made South Australia a leader technologically and, and policy-wise. Tasmania, uh, the, the Liberal government is, is talking about uh, two... <laughs> 200% renewable energy by 2030, that uh, uh, they'll double their electricity capacity, that not only will all the ex existing um, uh, power be zero emissions, well that's easier for them because they've got all that hydro, mm. but uh, they'll double the capacity to support zero emissions industry and all the new stuff will be uh, zero emissions. So, so uh, uh, just as in Britain uh, it, it would be Curious, people would scratch their heads if anyone thought this was an issue that should divide Labor and the Conservatives. It's, it's an issue of national importance. Uh, 
uh, similarly in, in Germany, uh, well, and in, in Britain, of course, it was Margaret Thatcher, a conservative, who first made big issue, uh, a big issue of uh, climate because she... She, she, she had a chemistry degree from Oxford. She, she, yeah. uh, that's yeah. right, that's a big start. And uh, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, a conservative leader, uh, was a professor of physics. Mm. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, We're uh, back to the knowledge thing, uh, I think, Ross. <laughs> that's right, and no one in, no one in Germany would... No one in Europe would think of this being a left-right issue. Mm. So what here, what's happened here is a curious thing, but, it's, but the states are showing that we need not uh, downgrade uh, knowledge uh, the way we do at a Commonwealth level. This is a book of many ideas, and, and I have not got through all I wanted to get through, but I'm conscious of the time. So I could ask one more, or we could go to... Shall I ask one more? One more. All right. Um, so the last chapter looks at the choices we face now, and, and so we can go back to the way we were before the pandemic, and those are the kind of noises that our federal government is making. Or we can take this new path. Obviously, these choices are ultimately made by the politicians. How confident are you that they will make the right ones? Well, I, think the, I think the choices are ultimately made by us. Uh, um, it, I think it's a real cop-out to say the decisions are made by the politician. If they make made b bad decisions that stop us getting from full employment and cause our inc average incomes of ordinary people to be 10% lower in 10 years and now, that's their fault. It's our fault. We're, we're, we're in a democracy. We're still in a democracy. The democracy has got lots of problems of uh, downgrading of knowledge, uh, of vested interest in the political process, but uh, uh, I, I think we have to, have to as a community, uh, d discuss what's in the interests uh, of, uh, of the Australian public and uh, not let our political leaders uh, uh, sell us down the river. Uh, and uh, 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 so what are, what are the chances of the Australian community uh, uh, grabbing hold of this? Uh, well, I, I think that... Um, First of all, for the reasons that I said before, and not in response to democratic pressure, but I don't think the Commonwealth's position of the last few years is a viable one. I don't think a Conservative Prime Minister of Australia can say to the President of the United States, uh, uh, I accept your invitation to a heads of government meeting to discuss uh, more ambitious action on climate change, but I'm going to go there and say we're, we're not going to be more ambitious on climate change. Uh, uh, for, for those very crude geopolitical reasons, uh, we will change. Uh, but the, the big question, I, I've got no doubt about that, but uh, the big question is whether we'll change with good heart and use the opportunity or uh, reluctantly and uh, deny ourselves full employment and rising incomes. I don't think there's any fundamental uh, policy constraint in Barcaldon. Uh, as I say, say in the uh, acknowledgments of the book, uh, uh, the Shire has beneath its feet the world's richest coal resource and has above its head Eastern Australia's uh, richest uh, solar resource. And uh, uh, people right across that community, and uh, uh, Jane and I interact uh, at great length with the whole range of people there, uh, they, what they want is jobs. Uh, they've had no new jobs for a generation except in coal. They'd much rather have sustainable jobs than unsustainable jobs, but if no one uh, give, offers their kids and grandkids a, a, a sustainable job, they'll welcome an unsustainable one. And, uh, and part of breaking the uh, continued resistance in the community to, to the structural changes uh, uh, it, it, it is creating alternative opportunities, and they can be made, and they can be much richer opportunities than what we're leaving behind. Thank you. All right. So if you've got a question, sing out, and I'll repeat the question uh, for Ross. Oh, one down the front. So the, the curiousness of the, the, the way the federal government looks at climate change and States climate change. Is it as simple as winning an election, putting fear into people and winning an election? I'll just repeat that. So the, the difference between the Feds and the States is, is it, on the Feds' part, just a s simple matter of doing it to win an election. Is that a fair...? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, 
I think that uh, I've already said that I don't think there's any uh, very strong uh, 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 electoral resistance to the right action on climate change. Uh, but there are some some peculiarities of our political system. The, 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 those the, a few seats in Queensland uh, where uh, Clive Palmer spent eighty odd million dollars in the uh, really attacking, or well, basically attacking Bill Shorten, uh, uh, but uh, but with a, a an anti uh, an agenda that was opposed to action on climate change. Uh, uh, that uh, just re 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 repeating that to people who are anxious about their about their jobs in in towns that depend on co coal mining or coal power generation, I, I think had uh, some effects. I don't think that was effectively countered. Uh, I, 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 I think some of the uh, micro uh, politics. Uh, uh, the, uh, Bob, Bob Brown's a, a terrific person and uh, done a lot of great things for Australia, but I think that convoy uh, crystallised anxiety uh, uh, amongst those communities and a uh, combination of uh, Bob Brown and Clive Palmer was, uh, was very powerful uh, and uh, uh, Palmer also very influential on the same sorts of uh, issues in Western Australia where uh, uh, the, uh, where the polling a few um, a few months before the election was very different from the uh, the uh, final outcome, uh, but I, I don't think there's a, that that reflects some uh, fundamental reality of the electorate. Uh, I don't think that the uh, uh, c climate change story, the economic benefits of doing it right, uh, was uh, brought to account in the way that it could have been. So when you say uh, it's, it's just for votes. Uh, in, there's a sense in which that's true, but it was no more just for votes than, than, uh, the, the, than with uh, um, uh, the, pr the Premier of Queensland, who uh, went, went to uh, the election and won an increased, big increased majority, m winning those same seats. Uh, but uh, uh, with a quite strong action, zero emissions by 2050, a very strong action, uh, in the meantime, but telling a story of uh, how those regional communi communities could actually benefit from getting the policy right. Uh, on the left. Oh, hi. Um, hi Congratulations on Reset. I loved it. Um, you've spoken a lot tonight about the centrality of full employment, yet today we know many Australians have moved into unemployment with the end of JobKeeper. Uh, you were advising the Prime Minister before. If you were advising um, the Prime Minister leading up to today, what would, you, what would your advice have been? Would you have ended JobKeeper today? And secondly, uh, still keeping your Prime Ministerial advisor hat on, with the May budget around the corner, um, having read the book, there are many policy prescriptions in here. If there was one in your book that you would get into this May budget, what would it be? Uh, I think I, if I only had one, now that, that's an awful constraint, but uh, <laughs> if, I, if I only had one, I, I point out in the book that the, 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 the program that uh, Biden went into the presidential election on 1.7 trillion for uh, climate change related infrastructure, uh, if you did that in Australia, you'd be spending 50 billion a year. Uh, uh, from now on, you know, on the same per capita basis mm. as, as the United States. Well, I think if I only had one, that's what I'd do. Uh, and, and that would provide a lot of the growth in demand that, uh, uh, that, that we won't be getting any more from JobKeeper and JobSeeker. I wouldn't actually, I'd, I'd keep phasing out JobKeeper and, and JobSeeker. I wouldn't actually get rid of them until uh, we, we we were close to full employment. Uh, uh, they're, they're not the right for the reasons I said earlier. They're, they're not the right policies to keep us employed forever. But uh, but but it, um, bridging that gap to full employment is very important. The single most important thing we could do, looking ahead to uh, sustainable uh, growth and to uh, export growth, uh, to to make uh, uh, the growth in employment sustainable. I'd. Uh, I'd, I'd pull a leaf out of uh, uh, Biden's book. Incidentally, you know, that, uh, Trump had uh, spent 1.2 trillion, now, now, trillions of real money, uh, 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 on uh, the, the, the 
COVID economic program. Uh, Biden got through uh, 1.8 billion in his first week in office. And this new program, it, it promised 1.7, but it seems to be shaping up at about 3 trillion. So, uh, uh, so the US probably will have full employment uh, in, in a year or so. Uh, there was one down the front. Uh, you, you spoke about um, rentiers and the need for exports, uh, and if, if your book talks about inequality. How does negative gearing go in this? Is it a Ponzi scheme of, with imported capital distorting to the building industry? Is it what would you say about negative gearing? Well, I didn't get. Uh, Richard wanted me to be brief on the cash flow tax. One of the things with the cash flow tax, you don't get a deduction for interest payments, uh, and there's lots of advantages in that. Uh, so, so the issue doesn't arise. What negative gearing does is it allows you to deduct from other income uh, the, the uh, interest payments on, uh, uh, on your investments in housing. Well, that issue disappears because deductions for interest disappear, but not only in housing, in everything. Uh, on the left. Uh, please, Professor, you've been at this, I think, at the highest levels for 50 years, close enough to 50 years. R roughly, yeah. How, how do you maintain, how have you maintained your optimism? <laughs> have you stayed so positive, yes. Uh, I don't, if you look closely at Reset, I don't think you can accuse me of being an optimist. I, I, I say... I say, I say that we face a choice between dog days and, uh, uh, and restoration of Australia. And I, if I was an optimist, I'd say we're, 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 we've made that choice and we're heading for restoration of Australia. I'm saying that the last budget shows we haven't yet made the choice. Uh, uh, and the choice will be made over the next year or two of whether we go back to the dog days, which will be worse in future than we had in, uh, in 2013 to 19. Uh, or we make the choice to uh, go to full employment with rising incomes of ordinary people. It's a choice we haven't made that. But uh, how do I keep up my spirits? Uh, well, it hasn't all been bad. I, I worked for Bob Hawke when we put in place what gave us Australia the strongest productivity growth in the world. Um, so. Uh, uh, it's a bit hard to uh, only be uh, pessimistic about the prospects when you've lived through that. And there was one at the front. Uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, I have not had time to read the book yet, but uh, I've read only a few lines about uh, where you speak about uh, the Reserve Bank, bank going uh, negative with interest rate. And uh, usually, when uh, you have interest rate going uh, negative, you may end up with, uh, creating uh, inflation because there will be a lot of uh, money being created when they buy bonds. I mean, the few lines that you say about uh, going uh, negative interest rate and uh, the Reserve Bank uh, buying more bonds, it will involve the, the, the Reserve Bank to, to print more money. And uh, what impact is going to be for uh, for inflation? And uh, if we can see, like uh, in Switzerland or uh, in Japan, where they've been doing the same thing for quite a while, you have seen that uh, they had uh, kept the uh, unemployment down, unemployment unemployment down, and uh, they had the deflation and. Uh, the income was still stagnant, it was not increasing. So if you advocate something like that, so what's going to be with the, the Australian economy? Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, this is about these sort of special measures that various um, uh, central banks around the world, uh, and particularly some of those countries you mentioned, yeah. have taken of going negative on interest rates. Yeah, exactly. Some of them have handled it better than others. Uh, your question is, Ross, what would be the effect yeah. in Australia? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm very one very strong point I make in the book is that uh, it's a mistake, and it was a big mistake in the dog days for uh, uh, Australia to run 
tighter, more restrictive monetary policy than the rest of the developed world if our economy is not stronger than the rest of the developed world. And I make the comparison with the United States where uh, uh, when they went from in unemployment a few percentage points above Australia to a couple of percentage points below Australia in the same time, we just stayed steady at five point something percent. Uh, the big difference was monetary policy and uh, uh, that gave us a higher exchange rate than we otherwise would have. I mean, a higher exchange rate makes uh, reduces investment in the uh, uh, export industries. It puts more emphasis on simple government expenditure in creating employment. You don't get that balance between uh, 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 government expenditure and uh, 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 business investment that, that gives you sustainable investment. So for all of these reasons, it was very costly for Australia to run tighter monetary policy than, than the rest of the world. On the particular point of negative interest rates, um, wh what I'm saying is if the rest of the developed world's running negative interest rates and our economy's uh, on, on, in not as strong, uh, well, uh, uh, not, uh, no, no stronger than the rest of the world, then we uh, make a very big mistake and make life very difficult for uh, Lots of people. If we don't unnecessarily, if uh, if we don't run negative interest rates as well, um, uh, I don't think there's any risk of inflation being a problem until uh, we are at full employment. Once you're at full employment, you uh, you have to reassess, uh, and there uh, there may be circumstances in which you've got to pull back demand quite a lot. And it's very important at that point that you don't do it only through raising interest rates as we have tended to do. You, you, you need to do it through a combination of raising interest rates and raising taxation rates uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to stop uh, um, demand leading to accelerating inflation. But I don't think there's any risk of that happening now. Uh, the time we have to think in advance of what we will do when we've got full employment uh, and, if we, uh, and the time to take action uh, to pull back demand is when we've got full employment. Look, that is where we'll leave it. You, you can uh, talk to Ross further as long, Dan says, as long as you buy a book. So <laughs> buy a book and you can talk to Ross. Uh, he'll be available at the, at the book-selling table. Good economic costs. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much.